Welcome to Spine Academy. This is the second chapter in a series on cervical spondylosis. This chapter is really going to focus on cervical spine imaging. We're going to talk about not only the types of imaging that are obtained, but what kind of information we get from each of those types of imaging. Before we do any of that, we're going to start by setting the stage, describing what we call tomographic imaging and the cross-sectional planes that we use to evaluate the spine. Then we're going to talk about cervical spine MRI and the role that it plays in identifying not only uh, spinal cord and spinal nerve problems, but also looking at the fluid around the spinal cord and some of the soft tissues of the neck. We'll talk about the CAT scan and the role that it plays in describing and defining bony anatomy. It's probably the single best study we have for looking at bony anatomy. We will talk about dynamic x-rays. So those are flexion and extension x-rays that capture the motion in your cervical spine, understand the dynamics of your spine, which are often hard to get with static imaging like MRIs and CAT scans. And then finally, we'll talk about the role of CT myelography. We don't get that on everybody, but some patients who cannot get an MRI scan, that's a very valuable test for understanding the anatomy. We'll cover all of these imaging types and more and the role that they play in the chapter to come. The first concept that we want to cover in this chapter is going to be the topic of tomographic imaging. So tomographic imaging is any type of imaging that allows you to look at a three-dimensional structure and to slice it into two-dimensional planes. So as a good example, if you look at this person over here, when you look at this patient who's kind of facing you, you can take three different types of slices, and those are the medical planes that we generally look at. So the first slice to talk about is a slice right down the middle, like if, right through the middle of the screen. If you took a slice of me and looked at me from the side, that would be this plane right here. That is called the sagittal plane. The next slice to talk about or sequence to talk about is something called the axial plane. So that's a slice right down the middle of me. So if you imagine you took a slice of me like this and we're looking at it in cross section, that is called the axial plane and again is depicted here. Now the axial plane is very important to mention the convention. For the axial plane, you have to imagine that the patient is lying flat on their back and you are at their feet looking up at slices of them. So the image becomes left, right, reversed. What you're looking at on the right side of the screen will be the left side of the body and vice versa. That's the axial plane. It it can get confusing, but just imagine that. You are looking at a patient, standing at their feet, looking up at slices of them, the axial plane. The last sequence to talk about is the coronal plane. So that is a plane like this, where you take a slice right down the middle of me, and that's depicted right here. Now, not every study is going to have a coronal plane. You'll see it most commonly on CAT scans. You don't always see it on MRI scans. But these three planes, the sagittal, the axial, and the coronal plane, those are the planes that we use when we're trying to understand the three-dimensional anatomy of the cervical spine. Probably the single most valuable study that you can get of the cervical spine is the cervical MRI. This is a sequence that really is good for identifying the spinal cord, spinal nerves, the discs, fluid, and other really soft tissue structures. So for example, if you look at this image here, this is a T2 sagittal sequence MRI. So we'll break that down a little bit. It's a sagittal sequence. That's, remember, a slice like this. It's an MRI scan, which is done on that detector in the small tube that you're kind of narrowly stuck in. It takes you like 45 minutes to get. It's a T2 sequence because it highlights very specific structures. So it's a T2 sagittal MRI. There's some structures you can identify that should look familiar to you at this point. So right in the front of the spine here, you can see this is the stack of blocks that make up the cervical spinal column between the blocks themselves. Like here you can see C3, C4, C5. Between those, you can see the discs, these little black or gray structures that are between them. That again is the spinal column. Right behind the spinal column, in the spinal canal, you can see here, here's the spinal cord. So the spinal cord, again, it's about the size of my pinky in real life, and it's surrounded by spinal fluid. So spinal fluid, or cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, we often will call that, is white on a T2 sequence. And here you can see it kind of at the bottom of the brain, surrounding the brain stem, and then down here, surrounding the spinal cord. So the spinal cord will typically have a cushion of fluid all the way around it, which is called CSF, which you can see here on a T2 sequence as white. And then there's the structures in the back, the spinous processes, some of the ligaments and stuff that you can see here. Now beyond that, you can see kind of this is the back of the neck. You can see some of the fat, some of the muscle over here. But if you were to take a single slice, and let's say you're looking at a slice right here, a single slice, it would look like this. So this is an axial sequence now. 
also of a T2 MRI right at this spot. So this line right here will show you this is at C45. So what are we looking at here? Here we're looking at the spinal, we're looking again at a slice like this. You're standing at the feet looking up at slices. So the left side's over here, the right side is over there. You can see the spinal cord right here and you can see the nerve which would leave here on the left side or the nerve that leaves here on the right side. Now that nerve that leaves there, you can actually see the nerve fiber sometimes. You can also see some fat and fluid around them. But when we're looking at an axial sequence, we're looking at the spinal cord, the fluid around it, and then the nerves as they leave right there. So now, neither of these sequences are single slices. When we're looking at a sequence like an MRI scan, we're looking at stacks of these images. So for example, if you look at this sequence right here, this is looking at the sagittal T2 sequence. This line right there tells you where that slice is. So you can see here, there's some joints in the back. Here you'll come up on the spinal cord again, the spinous processes over here. And you can kind of march from left to right through this axial sequence to look at the spine in multiple, like in one plane, but along multiple slices all the way from right to left to understand the anatomy in three dimensions. So you can kind of paint a model in your mind for what it looks like just based on that. And similarly, just like this, you can also get a sequence called the axial sequences. And this is a nice picture again of the axial sequences as you roll through it. So this will show you the axial sequence, that line will show you where it is, and you can again march your way through it. So we're looking at the spinal cord right there, the nerves on the left, the nerve on the right there, and you can check out the spinal cord and the nerves, everything, one sequence, one level at a time to kind of look at all the way from top to bottom when you look at the stack of sequences. So between the axial and the sagittal sequences, you can really get a sense of not only the spinal cord and the spinal nerves, but the discs themselves and some of the structures around them. The one weak spot for an MRI scan is bony anatomy. You can't see it really that well on this. It's very useful for a lot of stuff, but not great for bone, which is what we're going to talk about in the next sequence when we talk about CAT scans. So those are normal MRI images, uh, and they're very valuable. We talked about sagittal and axial sequences, but if you look at this image here, this is a patient that I took care of, a very interesting young man who's a race car driver. And here you can see the sagittal T2 sequence with a fairly large disc herniation here. We come through the axial sequence, you can see it over there. This guy has a fairly large disc herniation pressing on his spinal cord and pressing on the spinal nerve there. You can see here how the spinal cord looks pretty good, but as you come up to this spot right there, he has a large disc herniation right on the right side there, causing pressure on the spinal cord. So looking at the axial sequences, looking at the sagittal sequences, we can really form a pretty good understanding of where the problem is that was causing him difficulty standing and walking, and then render the right treatment by going in from the front and taking out that disc herniation to free up the spinal cord and free up the spinal nerves so that he's back to racing cars once again. So as I said before, the MRI scan is probably the single most valuable study to look at the cervical spine. But it's got a big weak spot, which is that it's not very good for looking at bony anatomy. That's where the CAT scan comes in, or the CT scan comes in. If you look at this picture, for example, here, this is a sagittal sequence through the cervical spine on a CAT scan. So this is a slice, like somebody standing up facing us. This is a slice right down the middle. You can see the spinal column here, the vertebral bodies. Again, this is C1 and C2, and then three, four, five, like we had looked at in the last chapter. This is the stack of blocks themselves. But you notice a couple things. You can't really see the discs that well. You just see where the discs are supposed to be. You also really can't see where the spinal cord is. You can just see kind of where the spinal canal is. I mean, you see the gap where the spinal cord should be, but it doesn't show you very well the spinal cord itself. However, it really shows you very well what the spinal bony anatomy looks like, and that's the strength of this study. So if you were to take this single slice and take a slice through it right here at C45, you would get an image that looks like this. So this is again an axial sequence. Here we're looking at the vertebral body in the front, Here's the lateral masses, here's the lamina and the spinous process. You can just catch a little glimpse of that on this slice here. Those are all structures we talked about in the first chapter. Right here you can see, here's that triangular shaped spinal canal. That is where the spinal cord sits. Can't see the spinal cord, but you can see where it goes. But you can really see very well what the spinal anatomy looks like. These are high resolution images, and if you take one up very high, for example, you get an image that looks like this. Here's the C12, here's the lateral mass of C1, here's C2, what's called the odontoid process. You can get really clear pictures of what the bony architecture itself looks like. Now, similarly, you can take a coronal slice through a CT scan, and these are almost always available. They're not always available for an MRI. Coronal sequences, most of the time, are available for a CAT scan. So again, this is a slice like this through the middle. This is a slice kind of like this, and it gives you a picture that looks like this. 
Here you can see the left and right symmetry, so the left would be here, the right would be there. You can see all the structures, and if you were to work your way through it and really do it as a series of slices, you get a picture that looks like this. So here you can see the sagittal sequences marching kind of from right to left. You can look at the joints over here, these are the lateral masses that we talked about. Slide through it, see some other structures, here's the vertebral bodies, here's the spinal canal over there. Similarly, this is the sagittal sequence with slices. You can get the same on the coronal sequences. You can slide through them and look at the vertebral bodies in the front. You can see the lateral masses and stuff on the sides. Really understand what the bony anatomy looks like by stacking up all of these slices and evaluating them. This is most of the time how your surgeon will look at these images. Now, if you were to look at abnormal studies, so those were all normal images, but here's a couple examples of abnormal pathology. Here's a sequence in somebody with ankylosing spondylitis. This here, you can see these bones have all kind of fused themselves together. People have what they call colloquially uh, bamboo spine with ankylosing spondylitis. It's very brittle and somebody has a fracture right there and you can see that discontinuity is not normal. That big arrow is kind of pointing right to it. Similarly, if you look at this person, they had an unfortunate fracture in the C5 vertebral body. So that's this right here. You can see usually the bodies, the vertebral bodies themselves are rectangular in shape. This one unfortunately is fractured and parts of it are actually encroaching on the spinal canal here. That's an unfortunate thing that can cause pretty severe spinal cord injury, unfortunately. But then not everybody has to be traumatic. You can often find people, this is a CAT scan through somebody with just advanced degenerative disease or cervical spondylosis, like this chapter, this curriculum is all about. When you look at it here, you can see the disc is a bit worn out at the C4-5 level, at C5 and C6. You can see that there's almost no disc at all. There's some reactive osteophytes, these kind of little bone spurs that are in the front of it there. So really what CT scans are good for and what these studies are designed to show, what I was trying to highlight with some of these pictures is that it is excellent for looking at the bony anatomy. It's not great for looking at soft tissue structures. You can barely see the spinal cord, the spinal nerves and stuff on these. But together with an MRI scan, it gives you a very complete picture tomographically of what the cervical spine looks like. So MRI scan and CAT scan are probably the most valuable sequences we have in imaging the cervical spine. Those show us what the bony anatomy looks like as we just saw with the CAT scan. They show us the spinal cord, spinal nerves, discs, things like that that you otherwise can't really see. But it's really interesting to note, and it's important to underscore, that both for CAT scan and MRI scans, you're lying flat on a table. So you're lying flat and you're static and you're seeing what your spine looks like in that static condition. So what do you think you miss in that? You miss how your spine reacts to normal load. So when you're standing up, leaning forward and leaning back, you can't see any of that stuff in an MRI or a CAT scan. And that's really the role of these studies, dynamic x-rays. This is a very valuable study. It's not sufficient alone, but really gives us an important piece of information, which is how your spine reacts to load. So in this picture here, for example, you can see this person standing up, leaning all the way forward. You can see what the alignment of the cervical spine looks like here. You can even see like their jaw. You can see the relation of all these different structures. And you can see what it looks like leaning back. So you get a sense of what their range of motion is like, which is not something that you can capture with any of the static imaging we talked about before. You can also see a little bit kind of what the discs themselves, you can see the disc at five, six is a little bit more worn out. Here you can see the same thing, some bone spurs there. It's a little bit crude. It's not as good as say a CAT scan for looking at bone spurs, but it's very good for looking at kind of the global alignment. This next picture is gonna give you a sense for example, of some pathology. So here you can see this person's leaning all the way forward to so their neck, excellent range of motion, leaning all the way forward, excellent range of motion, leaning all the way backwards. But if you really pay close attention to this person who came in with really bad neck pain with shooting pain at the back of their head, they have nice alignment over here when they lean back, but when they lean forward, you can see there's a gap that forms there, probably four or five millimeter gap that forms between C1 and C2, and that is considered cervical instability. You can't capture something like that on, on static imaging. You have to get dynamic imaging, and that is the power of dynamic x-rays. So between an MRI and a CAT scan, which show you the soft tissue anatomy and the bony anatomy really well, and dynamic x-rays, which show you the range of motion and exclude any kind of instability, you can really paint a very full picture of what's happening with the cervical spine. So it's very common these days for people to have things like pacemakers in place or spinal cord stimulators or some reason that they can't get an MRI scan. And as I said earlier in this chapter, an MRI scan is really the gold standard. If you had to pick only one study, that might be the one to get.
But people that have implants like that, that prohibit them from getting an MRI, or sometimes people are like machinists and might have metal in their body or bullet fragments or things like that, all of those would preclude people from getting an MRI. And in those situations, we get a study called a myelogram. Now, a myelogram has been around for a really long time. It predates MRI, and before MRI really became popular, it's how imaging was done. I wanted to commit a small section of this uh, chapter to myelography just for those people that need to, to understand it. So myelography is a procedure that is done typically with a CAT scan. It does require the placement of contrast material into the CSF itself. So the way that that's done, this animation shows really nicely, uh, is that people will have a spinal tap or a lumbar puncture performed. And that's usually done by the radiologist and it usually takes about 15 minutes. It's done with x-ray guidance and they put a needle in through the skin. So it's like a small needle stick, goes through the skin, between the spinous processes and into the spinal canal in what, into what's called the thecal sac, and that's where the spinal fluid itself is. They will inject some contrast material that goes into that, and the contrast will kind of distribute itself into the CSF and allow them to get images. It used to be that they got just x-rays, and now they will still get x-rays, but frequently we will get, after getting contrast into it, get a post-myelogram CT scan, or what some people would just call CT myelogram. So a CT myelogram will give you pictures that look like this. So you'll get an image that's not only a sagittal sequence, but also potentially an axial sequence. Now, when I get a myelogram on a patient, once they get the spinal tap and they get the fluid in there, I think we get the whole thing. I usually will get a cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, because once it's in there, you may as well get imaging through the whole thing, just to spare people having to get that spinal tap repeatedly. But you'll get an image that looks a lot like this. So it looks just like a CAT scan, because it is a CAT scan. We're looking at the bony anatomy right here, but the difference here is that you can see this white fluid. Now this is contrast material, and it is in the CSF, or the spinal fluid, which surrounds the spinal cord. So you can kind of see the silhouette of the spinal cord here, or the outline of the spinal cord within the spinal canal. So that's a big difference between this study and the CT scan without the contrast within it. Yeah, when you get a single slice, like let's say you're looking at a slice through here, through the C4-5 level, that will give you a picture that looks like this. So on this picture, you can see again, the C4 vertebral body, a little bit of the disc space there, some of the masses, but here you can see contrast within the, the canal surrounding the spinal cord, and you can even see small root fibers. So just by comparison, if you were to pull up an MRI scan through the same, same level, you could see kind of a comparison between a CAT scan myelogram, or a CT myelogram axial image, and an MRI axial image. Both of them show you the outline of the spinal cord, the CSF space itself, you can even see the little rootlets. Here you can't see much. Here you can see the foramen itself and some of the structures surrounding the spine. The contrast does not get into that space. It stays very much limited to the thecal sac or the space surrounding the spinal cord. So you kind of lose the ability to resolve what's happening further out here. But a CT myelogram is a very valuable study to look at what's happening to the spinal cord and to look at what's happening to the spinal nerves when an MRI is not an option. In this chapter, we've covered some important topics for cervical spine imaging. We talked first about tomographic imaging and the different planes that we look at when we're looking at three-dimensional structures with medical imaging. We talked about the MRI scan and the importance of an MRI for looking at soft tissue structures like the spinal cord, spinal nerves, discs, and the fluid around the spinal cord. We talked about the CAT scan and the importance of a CAT scan for looking at the bony anatomy of not only the joints and the vertebral bodies, but seeing the bony anatomy in the setting of trauma and even degenerative disease. We talked about flexion and extension x-rays, which are the dynamic studies that we use to understand the bony alignment and range of motion that people have in their neck. And then lastly, we talked about CT myelography, which is a very good study when people can't get MRI scans. It's an option for looking at the spinal cord and spinal nerves and for looking at other structures when you can't get an MRI scan. We use all of these studies to understand anatomically what is happening to a patient and what structural pathology might explain their symptoms. In the next chapter, we're really gonna talk about cervical spondylosis and the structural findings associated with that. So we'll talk about the degenerative cascade and disc degeneration, joint arthritis, all of those things that make up cervical spondylosis. We'll talk about foraminal stenosis and central stenosis, and thereafter we'll talk about the symptoms that people can develop from that. Those discussions are really the crux of this whole curriculum on cervical spondylosis, and they will build strongly on the foundation you guys now have in understanding cervical spine anatomy and understanding the imaging types and the ways to interpret those images. Thanks very much for watching. I hope you learned something and found this valuable, and I look forward to seeing you in a coming chapter.